child's reaction to hospitalization. Now, during early infancy, we really don't have much of a reaction to hospitalization. The young infant more or less has a global reaction to the change in their environment and routine. And we can kind of counteract this global, maybe dis-ease feeling in infants by trying to keep their routine as similar as possible. During late infancy, the toddler years and preschooler years, uh, we have separation anxiety, which impacts their reaction to hospitalization greatly. Uh, for separation anxiety, there are three stages. The first stage of separation anxiety is protest. This is where the infant will cry, scream, look for their parents, cling to their parents and not want their parents to leave if they're in the hospital. Um, they also try to avoid and reject strangers. One thing you can see with this is as the parents are cling or as the infant is clinging to their parents, they tend to bury their head into their parent's shoulder or look away from you. They won't look at you. It's almost like they're trying to burrow into their parents in order to protect themselves. They're protesting that the parent may want to hold the hand the infant or toddler or preschooler off to you and leave. They're protesting. The second stage of separation anxiety is despair. Now you might say, well, how quickly does despair follow protest? And that really varies quite a bit by the individual child. A toddler or preschooler who's been at uh, daycare for a while, uh, they may not go into this despair until the parents have been gone for a significant amount of time. On the other hand, a child who's never been away from their parents may enter into despair rather quickly. During despair, the child will be inactive, they'll be withdrawn, and they'll just appear to have a lack of interest in their environment. They tend to just lay there in their crib and not do anything. They're not interested in you or anything else that's going on. The third stage of separation anxiety is detachment. Now during detachment, um, this is really a stage where there is resignation to the situation. It's a superficial adjustment. Um, during this time, the child appears to be happy and outgoing. They'll run down the hall and jump right into your arms. But in reality, this behavior is one of resignation. It's almost like they've given up on the parents coming back. You should not ever um, mistake it as contentment because it is not contentment. Ways to minimize separation anxiety. The first way we can do this is by having unrestricted visiting by parents and significant others. We want to allow parents to sleep or stay overnight with the child. We're going to try to assign the same nurse to care for the child day after day. We're going to try to maintain the usual activities of the child, such as meals, naps, rituals, etc. When you uh, admitted your child to the hospital, hopefully on the assessment, you checked into this. When do they eat at home? When do they take their naps? Do they need a special bear to sleep with? Do they need a bedtime story? We'll try to find these things out and then we'll try to follow these usual daily activities as much as possible. It's also important to give the child permission to be unhappy. Uh, let them know it's okay to cry. Um, if parents are leaving and the child is crying and protesting, remain with the child. Hold them. Talk to them. Tell them it's okay uh, to be unhappy that mom's leaving, but mom will be back. Uh, we want to suggest ways for parents to explain leaving and returning and when they'll be back. Remember that um, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers really don't have a good sense of time. Um, preschoolers, uh, if parents say, I'll be back at lunch, that will give them some sense of when the parent's coming back. Or if they can say, when a certain TV program is on, I should be back. That will help the child. Telling a child the parents will be back at noon means nothing to them because they can't tell time. If parents can't remain with the child all day, it is more helpful to have short, frequent visits than one long visit. In other words, if parents have to work, it would probably be better if they could um, come in before work, come in at lunchtime, and then after work, rather than taking a morning off 
and staying with the child, but that then not coming back until the next morning. Uh, it's very important to allow children to have a favorite object from home. This might be a blankie. It might be a favorite sippy cup they drink from. It could be a doll. These objects um, help the child feel secure in a strange environment. Now, with the toddler and preschooler, as well as having separation anxiety, they also experience feelings of loss of control. Uh, this feeling of loss of control is due to physical restriction. Remember that those toddlers, as soon as they can stand up and start walking, they want to do that almost continuously. They don't like sitting down. Um, and suddenly they're in the hospital and they probably have to stay in a crib. Uh, think of that preschooler who is probably very much into exploring their environment uh, and they're stuck in bed. So that gives them a feeling of a loss of control. They also have a loss of the routine that they had at home. No matter how much we try, we can't exactly duplicate the routine that was home. This disrupts many of the rituals they have. And if you recall, it's the rituals that toddlers and preschoolers have that help them make sense of their world and help them um, not have too much anxiety. Because of this loss of routine and physical restriction and loss of control, we find that toddlers and preschoolers may uh, display temper tantrums. They may have regression. Regression is where maybe the toddler who's drinking from a sippy cup wants a bottle. Preschoolers sometimes want that too. Both age groups of children, well especially the preschooler because they probably are toilet trained, may go back to uh, being incontinent of urine. Um, those are just normal responses to the hospitalization. Both may experience negativism, telling you no. They may resist therapy and treatments. Then on the other hand, they may withdraw. Toddlers and uh, preschoolers also have fear of pain and injury. And because of these fears of pain and injury, they tend to be very uncooperative. Interventions. What can we do to help this? Well, we can start by preserving the parent-child interactions. Don't put yourself between the parent and child unless it's absolutely necessary. We're going to allow the toddler and preschooler as much movement and freedom as possible. Now, this doesn't mean that we can allow the child to be running up and down the, the hallways. We do still need to set limits. But um, for a toddler, maybe we can get some sort of plastic mat to put on the floor where they can sit and play with some of their toys on the floor. Same with the preschooler. We can allow the preschooler perhaps to be up and about in the room. Uh, we're going to maintain home routines and food preferences whenever possible. Uh, if there's nothing at the hospital the child really likes to eat, ask the parents, what does the child do eat at home? Would you like to bring some of it in for them? We can let them know that. We're going to also allow young children to express pain, to say ouch when something hurts. Now, like I said, children are very, very afraid of pain. Young children are. Sometimes if you tell them, um, you know, they're crying, they're out of control, and this works better with preschoolers than it does with toddlers, but sometimes you can tell them, yes, I know it's going to hurt, but it's not hurting now. Uh, we need to do this. When I do it and it starts to hurt, then say, ouch, instead of crying. Then I'll know what's going on. And you'd be surprised. But uh, many young children will respond to this, and will, it will help them maintain a little bit more control until they're actually experiencing what they're afraid of. Young children also have very poorly defined body boundaries. For example, they fear they'll lose all of their body's blood when they receive an injection. Um, think of a balloon, and if you stuck a pin or a needle into it, everything on the inside of the balloon, the air would just all of a sudden explode out. Children kind of have a fear that when you prick their skin that all of those insides will come out. Ways you can help with this is after they have an injection uh, you can cover the site with a band-aid. That'll cover up the little hole and that'll help alleviate that fear. Um, we can also allow children to play with things such as stethoscopes, tongue depressors, now with a stethoscope, if you need to listen to your toddler or preschooler uh, and they don't want to cooperate and they're afraid, sometimes you can use a bear or a doll as a transition object. In other words, you can listen to the bear or doll's heart 
and um, you know pretend like you're listening to it and then listen to the child sometimes that elicits a lot more cooperation and gets rid of some of the fear um, remember tell your children what you're doing um, don't give them choices if choices don't exist um, school age child they can accept separation from their parents a lot easier than a younger child but they also miss their peers usually you don't see the three stages of separation anxiety um, these children may experience loneliness and boredom if you find that a child is sleeping all the time or watching nothing but TV you know their, their eyes just don't leave the TV it could be that they're lonely and bored it's not that they're really entertaining themselves with the TV it's just that there's nothing else to do it's very important to spend time with the school age child even if they don't seem to want to talk to you if you spend time in uh, their room it will be appreciated and they'll probably begin to open up to you now with the school age child again we can minimize the loneliness the boredom by allowing liberal visitation this means allow younger siblings to visit perhaps even other children from their school it's helpful if we encourage letters and pictures from peers uh, the school age child really appreciates it when they're in the hospital and they get one of those gigantic um, poster boards signed by everybody in the class that's really appreciated sometimes uh, school age children worry that if they're in the hospital or gone from school too long they'll be forgotten their best friend will find a new best friend and so by allowing them to talk to their friends on the telephone or getting letters from them or visiting them it helps them have the feeling that no they haven't been forgotten it also helps relieve some of the boredom the school-aged child also may experience a loss of control school-aged children are becoming very independent they dress themselves uh, quite often they take themselves to school and get themselves home uh, and suddenly they're in the hospital they're forced to be dependent and if um, they're very ill they may even need help with getting bathed and uh, dressed and these are things they're very used to doing for themselves and so that loss of control can have quite an impact on them uh, we can minimize this loss of control by giving information to the child now remember you have to be developmentally appropriate a seven-year-old child is much different than an eleven-year-old child so gear the information to the child's developmental level we want to allow school-age children to do as much self-care as possible and we want to pro provide privacy whenever possible um, the school-age child really doesn't appreciate um, a crowd when bathing if they can go down and take a shower by themselves allow them to do that sure you might want to stand outside the shower door but do you really have to go into the actual shower with them if you don't just stay outside the door give them some privacy to help with boredom we can structure activities into their day uh, we can schedule out a time for homework a time for TV a time for Nintendo for phone calls now when you do this structure in your activity it's a really good idea to sit down with the child and perhaps the parent and actually write things out so if there is homework to be done the child needs to get it done during homework time otherwise perhaps we can't move on into TV time or Nintendo time uh, the child might balk at first but by having structure in their day it adds a little interest and they don't become as bored and you probably won't notice them sleeping as much of the time now school-age children also experience a fear of bodily injury pain death of illness or surgery the school-age child wants information they'll seek it out and you need to again give it at a developmentally appropriate level the school-age child may have the reaction of trying to act brave in other words they won't let you know that they're in pain they'll just act brave and say no they're just fine when really they could be suffering quite a bit or you may get a school-age child who whines and complains and tries to postpone procedures um, so you may have one end or the other it's very important to know uh, to let the child know that when they are experiencing pain that they need to let you know that they are and that it is okay to cry now even though you tell them this there are some children 
who still may not let you know that they are in pain. In this circumstance, you have to look at the child. What do they look like? Are they barely moving? Uh, let's say a child had a ruptured appy and it's one day post-op. Uh, they're in quite a bit of pain. They're just laying there. They're not moving. Uh, they're not talking. Perhaps they're just staring. Their vital signs may or may not be off. Uh, but you know they're in pain. If you had a ruptured appy one day post-op, you'd be in a lot of pain. So it may be up to you just to say it's time to have a pain med. Now, some school-age children try to avoid pain meds because they don't want an injection. And sometimes you just have to be firm and say, I know an injection hurts, but this is going to help you feel better, so this is what we're going to do. Someone has to be the parent. Someone has to take charge. And after all, our children just can't let, lay stiff as a log in bed. They need to move around or they'll develop many complications. Again, give permission to express pain. Give explanations at an appropriate cognitive level. Evaluate the child's understanding of their illness and procedures. Um, sometimes children have very big misconceptions of what is going on with them. Uh, with younger school-age children, uh, sometimes they can't verbalize very well, so maybe you'll have them draw a picture and then have them tell you about that picture. Uh, have the child verbalize how they feel. Now, remember that you may have to sit in the room with a child before they are willing to open up and verbalize to you. <coughs> now, the adolescent. Adolescents have a lot of concerns. Adolescents have a lot of concern about their body image. They also fear a loss of control or independence. We can minimize these by allowing adolescents to make decisions whenever possible, by giving explanations encouraging phone calls and visits from friends and allowing them to dress in their own clothes. Now when I say encourage phone calls, if they get to be excessive, you may have to set limits and that's okay. But do encourage at least some. <clears throat> 